I received a note from Rabbi Asher Meza, with whom I've dialogued on the air a couple of times. And he said, hey, why doesn't he come on today and discuss a topic? I said, well, let's, let's see if we can find a place to do it. We obviously have certain things in common and other things not in common. Rabbi Meza once believed many of the things I do and became an Orthodox rabbi and has some views that are accepted within the Orthodox community, others that are not. I said, well, tell you what, let's, let's focus on Isaiah 53 and let's have a conversation back and forth about it. So we're going to do that for a little while on this thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Rabbi Meza, welcome back to the Line of Fire. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you for having me. Sure thing. All right, so why, why don't you take up to two minutes just to give your viewpoint on who the prophet's speaking of in Isaiah 53? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you start off by saying that we have a lot in common, and you really don't know how much we actually do have in common in this area. So, like you so graciously said, that we agreed to speak on this segment of the prophets that I consider not only essential, essential for every Jew to understand properly, and as in this scenario, every other person who tries to justify what they believe with it as well, right? And the segment I'm referring to is the Song of the Suffering Servant. And friends, the reason I think Isaiah 53 is so essential to understand is because as I'm sure Dr. Brown would agree, it deals with redemption. And um, let me start out by saying, Isaiah 53 is not about the people of Israel, as you may have heard other counter-missionaries teach, and this is where I think Dr. Brown and I agree. But rather, the song should be understood as the song of the martyrs, as the individuals, uh, or the individual is speaking about who's about to be martyred. Now, it is Israel speaking in Isaiah 53, but it's not about Israel. And um, this, if you think about it, is the only way that at least I think the sugya correlates with what appears in Torah. In Torah, there is a formula for exile and redemption. And actually, this is why we have the books of prophets to begin with, right? To see that formula in action. In other words, in Torah, the formula is disobedience equals prophetic intervention, and if the words of that or those prophets are not heeded, which is uh, almost, those words are almost never heeded because those prophets are usually tortured and murdered, this would then equal exile, which, if you think about it, at least from a Christian perspective, would not exclude Yeshua. However, it would completely, I think, completely remove all the ex- all the exclusivity built around Yeshua. All right, well, let's, let's, just, stop, let's just stop there and, and okay. look at this one thing then. You and I no both say that it cannot refer to the nation as a whole, correct? Correct. Isaiah 53 cannot refer to the nation as a whole. And my understanding of, of why it cannot is because the subject of Isaiah 53 is not suffering for his own sins, but for the sins of of his people, he is righteous, they are guilty, whereas when the Jewish people have been in exile as a nation, we've been in exile because of our sins, and the prophetic witness is overwhelming to that effect throughout Scripture, and even right in Isaiah 40 through 53, there are many references to our sins as a nation. So we we agree on that point. It cannot refer to Isaiah 53 as a whole. Your position then, which you can articulate on the other side of the break, is that it is speaking of the righteous martyrs within Israel or the righteous remnant. Now, I'm quite sure I can demonstrate that doesn't work either, but we come back, let's, let's find out where Rabbi Oscar Mesa believes that Isaiah 53 is speaking of a righteous remnant or specifically martyrs, righteous martyrs within Israel. And I'll seek to show why it's speaking of the one righteous martyr. Welcome back to the Line of Fire on this Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I'm having a friendly conversation, mini dialogue, mini debate with Rabbi Asher Mazur about Isaiah 53. So uh, the passage begins 52.13 to 53.12, but there are other passages relating to the servants of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 53. They're all talking about the same individual or the same group, or does it vary? Are there different subjects? So Rabbi Mazur, your position is, that it's speaking of the righteous remnant within Israel, specifically 
the martyrs within Israel, is that correct? Specifically the prophets within Israel. Any messenger of the Almighty sent to wicked Israel at that time. All right, and so what, like why don't you go ahead and... Our, our, we agreed on... I'm sorry. You said that we agreed um, on verse chapter 5, you translated it as he suffered for our sins, and I think that's where our main disagreement actually begins, right? I mean, there it says... It says, In other words, it's me before a word means either for or because of, right? This is clear even in modern Hebrew. The question is, why would someone who is knowledgeable in Tanakh think that this is actually saying that someone is going to be martyred in, in an expiated way for their sins, right? So the way the JPS and many Jewish translations translate it as because of our because of our transgressions or our sins, not for our sins. But both words actually apply, but it's how you understand it. If someone suffers because of wicked Israel, because of their transgressions, well, that happens in everyday life. We know that the good suffer for for the wicked all the time. I mean, we just. Uh, Right, like many years ago, uh, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi I was talking to said to me, if I punch him in the face, he's suffering for my sins. Well, suffering in the macro. I mean, that would be suffering in the right, micro. Right, but the problem is, right. though, right, if, if you say because of or for, uh, either, either way, uh, same, same end result, what, what the text makes clear overall, explicitly clear, is number one— that by his wounds were healed. So if I punch someone in the face, they're not healed by my wounds. They're, they're, I'm not healed, rather, by wounding them. They're hurt, and God's going to judge me for it. The previous verse, though, tells us, in other words, it's not just how we're going to parse the mem there, right, uh, in, in Isaiah 53, 5, because the verse before it, the end of that verse, and the verse after it tells us exactly what it means. Verse 4 says that he's, he's borne our sorrows and carried our pains, right? And, and then uh, we thought he was suffering for his own sins. He was smitten by God. Instead, he was suffering for our sins. By his wounds were healed. And then how does Isaiah 53, 6 end? The Lord has caused to light upon him the iniquity of us all. So it, it's explicit in terms of what those those prepositions actually mean. I wouldn't say it's explicit. It's completely hyperbolic. The whole chapter is, has a lot of symbolism. Now, it has to, first of all, align with the message in Torah, which is why I said that the formula that appears in Torah for exile, prophetic intervention, right, and ultimately once we repent, that ultimate redemption has to tie in with this. In other words, Isaiah was not the first prophet. Yeshua, if you believe, was the prophet, you would have to agree was also not the first or the last prophet. This has happened throughout Jewish history countless times over and over again. A messenger of the Lord is sent to wicked Israel. Israel is made, uh, Israel makes them to suffer. As a matter of fact, the New Testament aligns with this idea in Acts chapter 7, verse 52. It states, Which of the prophets did your fathers fail to persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you are his betrayers and murderers. In other words, it's tying the idea that those who are sent to wicked Israel are made to suffer. Why should someone believe that Isaiah 53 is in some exclusive manner only talking about one person? Right. So, so to ex- explain that, the, 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 we're not reading this in a vacuum. We're reading it as we see, for example, Isaiah 49, the same servant seems to have failed in his mission to Israel and God tells him, not only will you regather the tribes of Israel, but you're going to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. You might say, well, who is that referring to? Isaiah, the 50th chapter, speaking in very individual terms about the servant being having hair ripped out of his beard and suffering in a certain way. And then the end of 52, 13, what does it tell us there? That he's going to be highly exalted, right? Which, which prophet then? You're telling me that all the prophets are going to be so highly exalted in God-like terms that they'll be high and lifted up, the same terminology used about God in Isaiah 6, that you know the Midrash, which says about Isaiah 52, 13, that the servant of the Lord, speaking of the Messiah, 
will be more highly exalted than, than uh, Abraham, Moses, and the ministering angels. That certainly doesn't apply to, to any other prophet that's ever lived. And then as we I read through the... I think it applies to every prophet. I think so anyone every, who dies in the service of the Lord has something great awaating them. As a matter of fact, the... Great, the greater than Abraham, the Moses, and the ministering anything. angels? But, but, but hang on. Well, hang on. Midrash. There's another midrash that says that Isaiah himself was murdered by Manasseh. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, so this ties. I mean, no, no, no. But, but, but hang, but hang on. Let, let's just focus on this for a second, so so we can be fair to the, to what you're saying. Show if if Abraham and Moses are both prophets, okay? If they both suffer in certain ways for their for their faith, but you're but you're telling me every prophet that suffered is going to be raised up higher. Than Abraham, Moses, and the ministering angels? You're not going to find a syllable in Jewish tradition that says that. This is in Torah. First of all, Abraham is not understood to be that type of prophet. These are prophets post-Moses. In other words, every prophet has to be tested by the Sanhedrin. It means prophets that were sent to Israel for them to repent. Moses, um, Abraham existed before Israel was even a nation. My point is that if, the, if there is no exclusivity, then there's no definite Messiah in the context, i.e., who Christians claim this is only talking about, right? And who they claim that it's the only way to uh, say uh, I, I, I got to press you here, though. Show me mm-hmm. where in Jewish tradition it says that prophets like Jeremiah or Isaiah or others who suffered will be more highly exalted than Abraham, Moses, and the ministering angels. The Torah itself, the Torah North Tanakh, speaks of some, of some sort of afterlife, right? You know, so you'd only be relying on Midrashim that constantly contradict themselves, written by people who did not accept Yeshua as the Messiah. So you really can't use it. I mean, when you don't yourself consider them an authority. No, right? no, but I'm speaking Midrashim to you as a rabbi. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a well-accepted Midrash. It's, it's Midrash Tanchuma. Okay, it carries tremendous weight. It's widely accepted. I don't think uh, it carries and, tremendous and, weight. In the rabbinic community. But the bottom line is, okay, I'm, the bottom line is, you keep referring to Torah, all right? I'm, I'm letting you refer to either Torah or rabbinic tradition to back your point. It is a totally exclusive text because no one, no prophet, if they're just a, a regular human being, is going to be that highly exalted. Just what the text says there, the only one spoken of in terms like that in, in, in Isaiah is, is God himself. You know, Ram Venisa, high and lifted up in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. So it tells us that this one is going to be that highly exalted. And now I'm saying within your own traditions, it says he'll be even more highly exalted than Abraham, Moses, and the ministering angels. And you're telling me, well, any prophet who suffers will be. I'm saying, show me that. Show me that either in, in the Tanakh or in rabbinic tradition. I'm saying it doesn't exist. The Tanakh is mute in this area, and you're quoting one legend. Now, we know that people who are martyred for the Almighty get a special share in the world to come. This idea, and also, I started off my talk saying that this does not exclude Yeshua if you believe he's a prophet or he's a messenger. However, it's for sure not exclusive to Yeshua because he's talking to a specific people at a specific time who knew the Torah, who knew that Deuteronomy chapter 18 says that when Israel begins to emulate the nations of the world, the Almighty is going to raise up for them a prophet. In other words, Isaiah was a prophet. It doesn't even say prophet here, though, but it doesn't even say prophet anywhere in this text. Right. It's just as my my, my servant. Right, right, but, but you I said it refers to you said it refers to specifically to prophets. It doesn't mention no, that. I didn't it say speaks. That. A, I said it martyrs, speaks of an, But Isaiah is a prophet. Isaiah is a prophet. It mentions. It speaks about every messenger sent to Israel, whether you're a prophet, a, a, a messenger. But, but it's or, not. It's not speaking case, about the after. It's not speaking about the afterlife. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, shall be exalted. First, he suffers terribly, right? Verse 14. Verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. This is, this is at the end of this age. The, the insight comes. It's not, it's not the, the afterlife. But I, I, I want to I, I go back to this point, and then we've we got a break coming up, so, so you get to, to go first when we come back. I believe, clearly, Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, lays out exclusivity. That it, it cannot refer to Moses or, say, Isaiah or Jeremiah. And when you just discard Midrash Tanchum, I'd, I'd say that that's not in keeping with an Orthodox rabbi. If you want to qualify that you're not really Orthodox, that's fine. But I, I believe you, you believe you are. Others would challenge that. But we'll be right back. 
Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire. I'm speaking with Rabbi Asher Meza about Isaiah 53. Uh, t- tell you what, uh, we are trying to get in detail and focus on things. If we have to go a few minutes longer, are you able to do that, sir? Absolutely. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, I got in the last word. Why don't you respond, and then we can we can move on to elsewhere in the text. I'm I'm saying that we have no evidence in Scripture that uh, any of the prophets who suffered, be it Jeremiah, be it Isaiah, be it others who suffered or some were even killed, and we all agree on that. Yeshua himself references Jerusalem killing the prophets. There's no argument on that. Midrash even talks about the elders uh, in Israel being killed by the people at, at Mount Sinai. So there, there's a long history of that. But I'm saying nowhere does it say that they will be so highly exalted the way described in, in Isaiah 52, 13 to 15, that that ex- refers exclusively to Yeshua, and even by some rabbinic interpretation refers exclusively to the Messiah. So if you have one more comeback, go ahead, then we'll move on to another part of the text. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, you're quoting one midrash, right? How about many of the other midrashim that speak about Yeshua boiling in a cauldron of excrement, or the other midrashim that teach that the Messiah is no longer coming because that expired in the time of Hezekiah, right? In other words, we know, and I'm sure you agree, that the prophets were made to suffer. And I didn't only limit it to prophets, I said messengers in general. You say you're you're saying now, but that I'm only limiting it to prophets. No, no, that's, that's fine. If, if 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 I misheard okay. that or messengers or in general, that, prophets or messengers, the suffering, right? The songs of the martyrs is what I called it. But are you about to say that you're basing your proof on the ex, on the exclusivity of Isaiah 53 on a midrash? But that by the simple fact, every writer, virtually every student of those midrashim rejected Yeshua. I don't think that adds too much weight. To the exclusivity of Yeshua being spoken there, right? Uh, are yeah, you so, so just, just to respond, just to re- service? Uh-huh. Yeah, just to respond to that quickly. Uh, f- first thing is when you refer to various statements within Talmud about Yeshua, or or about say, for example, the we won't see any messianic days because it expired already in the days of Hezekiah. There's an immediate rebuke to that, you know, that statement, you know. Uh, God forbid, and it's it's in the midst of Talmud discussion going back and forth. It's different than a statement saying in, in Midrash Tanhuma, which is a a widely accepted statement elsewhere in rabbinic interpretation, to the point that it even colors some interpretation. And some would say, yeah, though that beginning section does refer to the Messiah, but then the rest of it refers to to Israel. But all I'm saying is this: I, I'm giving you two options. Okay, I'm giving you the option of proving it scripturally, and you cannot show me anywhere in scripture where a, a prophet or martyr will be that highly exalted, using, using even God-like language, the way it's described there. Or, since the Midrash interprets it a certain way, and you're an Orthodox rabbi, give me then rabbinic interpretation that supports your view. That's what I'm saying. Go either way. If, if you want to... If you I'm giving quote you a rabbinic your, interpretation first and helping you understand how Midrashim work. And I'm not sure how you feel that ten, that a Midrash in Tanhuma in some way outweighs Agadah and the Talmud itself. But in terms of asking me for proof in Scripture, you know that proof in Scripture doesn't exist. To, even oh, to okay, so then where are you getting it from? If wait, you're not getting wait, it from Scripture, and you're not getting it from hold tradition, on. where are you getting it from? I'm, I'm not the one claiming exclusivity. You know, which is why I'm including all prophets and messengers. You're claiming exclusivity right, let's, let's on try this again. because you know, hold on, hold forget, on. Forget, forget the Midrash. Exclusivity. Forget the Midrash for now. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, let, let, you have let nothing me, let me in Scripture a, to justify your position either, correct? Of course I ha- I'm quoting Scripture to you. All right, we, we've got to do our best to not talk past each other, okay? Because we're, we're both thinking individuals. We have the ability to digest an argument and, and, and respond to it, all right? So here's the issue. I am saying that the exaltation spoken of at the end of Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15, is unique. And it cannot apply to any other prophets who suffered. This is a high exaltation that can only refer to Yeshua, the Messiah. I'm basing that on Scripture. That's number one. Number two, I'm also saying, for a rabbinic Jew, isn't it interesting that there's a tradition that speaks of the Messiah being this highly exalted, in other words, something exclusive. So 
Don't want to deal with the midrash? That's fine. Don't want to deal with the tradition? Can you quote just, that it's, scripture? It's one view of my own. That's fine. Show me anywhere in the Bible, then, where any other individual is going to be this highly exalted. And you say, you can't. The, there's nothing in the Bible. So where's your position coming from? If it's not coming where's from the Bible, it's not coming from tradition. It's, where's so it coming from? What verse are you using? What it's verse 50, are you using? Start in 5213. Again, you can't use that verse because this is the verse in dispute. In other words, if it's not pointing to one specific person, by definition, it would have to include all messengers. But you're saying that you have proof, that you have biblical proof that it's talking about the Messiah. I'm so saying... I'm saying, oh, I could give you the proof easily through the rest of the chapter. I'm saying, show me where any other individual other than the Messiah will be this highly exalted. The I can show you Psalm 110, the Messiah is going to sit at God's right hand. He'll be that highly exalted, okay? But you show me... The notion me, of the Messiah does not even appear in Scripture. <laughs> I right. mean, I, I, I feel, I, listen, I, I'm like, doing no, my best to give you a shot, but I feel like you're playing silly games no, from here. the Peshaw level. Well, then you can't use verses from the chapter in dispute to say that it proves your point when this is the verse we're trying to decipher. If it doesn't point... I'm saying who... Uh, here, where does it speak? Where anywhere... For we Let's say this. We don't know who this is about. Okay, let's just say that. You and I discover this text one day in our Bible. Somehow we didn't have it before. We, we're missing pages in our Bible. We discover it in our Hebrew Bible and we begin reading it and we say, Wow. Who, who is that servant that is, is going to be so highly exalted? And when I look at the text, when I exegete it just on the plain level, I see, wow, this is so highly exalted. This is not what normally, I don't see this happening to anybody else except you know, the son of David, the, this promised redeemer yeah. that's going to rule the earth and so on. High, lifted up. Boy, that's that. the same language that's used in Isaiah chapter mm-hmm. 6 about God himself. Now, I believe that there is a reason that many people only think that it's talking about Yeshua, and it's simply because most people do not read the Hebrew Scripture, Jew and Gentile alike. I eat if all you know is the Gospels, then who else are you going to think it's talking about? But if you know Torah, if you know Tanakh, if you know the prophets, you know that the messengers of God, whether it's Moses, who wasn't allowed to enter the Promised Land, whether it's Jeremiah, whether in this case Isaiah, who himself was murdered, you would only come to the conclusion that this is speaking about messengers in general, unless you have a verse pointing to a specific individual, which you don't. You're quoting a midrash to try to justify it. I, I, I said, forget the midrash. I said, forget the midrash. Okay. Uh, all right. So t- then, t- tell you what, we got to agree. We got to break here. The text is in the singular. The text is in the singular. So I'm not going to interpret it in the pluralness as compelling reason. And I keep making the same point over again, which we're going to leave here and go on to something else. The exaltation it speaks of applies to no other human being in Scripture except the Messiah. Thanks for joining us, friends, on the Line of Fire broadcast. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown. Whenever possible, I have conversations with those who differ with me on different subjects. I love on Thoroughly Jewish Thursdays when religious Jews will call in and and ask honest questions and challenge what I believe. Many have been very gracious in doing so in the midst of our disagreements. And a few years back, I was uh, contacted by a Jewish rabbi, a man who was not raised believing these things, but became uh, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. But he believes in, in converting Gentiles into Judaism. There's controversy within the Jewish community over that. We've dialogued here and there, and he suggested maybe we chat again on the phone. I don't know, maybe we did a couple of months back. So I said, great, let's talk about Isaiah the 53rd chapter. So we've been in the midst of a discussion, but we're going to take just a few more minutes. But I want to start afresh because we've got new folks just tuning in. I want to start afresh for you. Uh, so Rabbi Asher Meza, let's, let's focus in on this. Uh, I say that Isaiah 53 is speaking of vicarious suffering, that the suffering of the servant was on behalf of, in place of, the guilty party, and that the servant's wounds brought healing to the guilty party, which is why it can't refer to Israel as a whole or even to the martyrs within Israel, because their suffering did not bring healing to those 
uh, that smote them, rather God judged them for that. So what's, what's your take on what seems to be vicarious suffering spoken of there? I don't think it's speaking about, or even it even sounds like it's speaking of, about vicarious suffering, suffering, but more of a reactionary suffering. This messenger or these messengers are suffering because of Israel, which is what's expected to happen when you take someone who's righteous and you send them to wicked individuals for them to repent. And I think that the Jews were expecting this. Um, the notion of prophetic intervention is clear in Torah that the Almighty will send the prophet when Israel begins to stray. Um, now, I'm not saying it's speaking about one specific individual. You're saying that. And um, I think if we don't know who it's specifically speaking about, it's right for us to assume, with that Torah backing, that it's speaking about any messenger sent to wicked Israel. All right, so, so just, just to understand this then, and we, we've got a short segment here, so we'll, we'll carry on just a couple of minutes into the segment that follows. Just to be, to, to be clear then, we know, for example, a passage like Second Chronicles 36, where God sends prophets to his people, prophets to his people, we reject them, we reject them, we reject them, we persecute them. Because of that, God's wrath comes on us. So we cause the prophets to suffer, and God judges us because of it. So rather than us being healed by the prophets' wounds, we, we ourselves receive judgment. How can you then explain where it says, and at the cost of his wounds, there's healing for us. Rather, based on your interpretation, the prophet comes to Israel, rebukes Israel, sinning Israel. Israel kills the prophet, but Israel's now judged by God for that. Israel doesn't receive healing, so I still don't understand how you have your view there. The language is hyperbolic. All, all of the prophets have to be understood uh, from that understanding. It's very poetic. Ultimately, Israel did receive healing but it's a shame that the messenger had to suffer. And this has happened many times before. I'm not sure why it's so hard for you to see it. Jeremiah suffered greatly for Israel. Moses suffered. Samson suffered. If you're a messenger of God, it should say in the application that you're going to suffer. All right, tell, tell you what, you resume there. we got a break. You start when we come back. Joining us on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, want to go back to Rabbi Asher Meza before I get to some other calls. And you were saying right before the break that the prophets would suffer when they bring messages to Israel, and ultimately they would somehow be, be healed by hurting the prophets. Uh, so anything you wanted to, to add to that, you got cut off by the break. Back to you. Mm-hmm. Well, first, I'd like to um, thank you for the show, and I— uh, appreciate how gracious and how kind and polite you are. I mean, I wish we could have more individuals with certain talk shows that are open to hearing different opinions. Even though we don't agree, we could still love each other at the end. Okay? Sure. I want to make that clear, that I appreciate you. Um, However, there is is an idea that I don't want to overlook here. Right? Now, I'm very familiar with the notion that the death of Sadiqim of righteous individuals act like a kapara. This appears throughout Midrashim. However, that was always understood figuratively. I, everyone always understood that without Teshuvah, there right. is no forgiveness, there is no atonement, which is why Correct. I'm sure you still make altar calls today. Sure. So this notion of someone taking the nation's sin upon themselves, or the people's sin, uh, it's it, really ultimately just means that that person is suffering for us, and we will ultimately see our salvation because of their suffering, but it's really because of the repentance that we make, the decision we make to even see that distinction, to see the result of our actions. And I think that the way you're explaining it, it sounds like you're getting stuck on first-stage thinking. Yes, ultimately, Isaiah suffered either because of, for, it's the same word in Hebrew, but no one, like really, with the Torah basis, would ever apply redemptive qualities to the individual or individuals it's speaking about here. Right? I mean, like, why would they, when the Torah itself told us to expect prophets 
it, it, and even the New Testament reiterates the idea that these prophets were mistreated and murdered. So I, right, but no, yeah, really so, so it, yeah, it, in, in response, uh, no, number one, since you quote Torah, it does mention Deuteronomy 18, God raising up a prophet. It doesn't mention the prophet's suffering there, just first thing. So at first reference, there's, there's no mention of the prophet's suffering. The, the second thing, while, while the prophets would intercede for their people, where the high priest would, would bear uh, the sins of his people on his, on his shoulders, on his breastplate when he went into the, the, the holiest place of all, the language that's used here goes beyond that. Uh, I say take the text for what it says. You say, no, it's hyperbole. I say, no, it means what it says. By his wounds were healed. And of course, everything is always with repentance. The blood sacrifice is always with repentance as well. And the whole chapter is, is very detailed and specific. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him. You'd have to say that every prophet who ever lived and suffered, that description was fit. Or he, he made his grave with the wicked and with, with the rich in his death. That, that each specific detail that's painted out here uh, is, it has to refer to every single prophet, which obviously it doesn't. Uh, my, my point would be, God could not have made himself more clear that he's speaking about an individual, that he's speaking about this individual who'll be highly exalted in even godlike way, just based on the, the Hebrew language used in, in, in comparing who to Isaiah children, 6. children, by the way? No, it doesn't right? say he has children. children. Where does it say that? Well, it said that he would see his offspring. I mean, it doesn't it said, I mean, you're, you're a it doesn't say his. You added okay. in his. You're a Zerah. Ah, He'll see well. seed, which could simply mean a future generation. End of uh, end of Psalm twenty two. Azera will yes, serve. Him. Talking Just talk about future shop, generations. Yeah. yeah, I am. The the phrase "your Azera" occurs nowhere else in the Bible. It doesn't say it means have your own offspring. That doesn't and it doesn't say it can't be a spiritual offspring. Azera means or, or seed, and it's typically always used as humanly seed. But I'm not even saying well, that this is particular to one individual. Well, Jer- the- Jeremiah had no children, so you're saying you couldn't reply to Jeremiah then? No, you're saying. But the text is very clear and specific. I'm saying that it's speaking about prophets and messengers in general, whether they had children or not. But then why and, does it... Yeah, so the, the fact is, it's all in the singular. I'm saying I'm taking it literally and not in a hyperbolic way. I'm saying through his wounds, we really are healed. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of all of us. And I, I also see that, that he will make many righteous as, as well. And it gives specifics about his death and that he's going to live beyond death. So, so to me, it's, it's as black and white clear that it's an individual. And, and I'll, I'll just say this, and then you can get, get a real quick last word in, and, and we'll move on to others. Uh, I, I appreciate your desire to have dialogue, and I know you seek to do that in, in your own settings, to bring on those who differ with you. And, and thanks for your graciousness towards me in, in the midst of our differences. But what, what I'd say is this. You are going in the right direction. You're just stopping short. Yes, it is a picture of the righteous martyr, but there's only one who is perfectly righteous who fulfills this. And yes, that's part of what God even embedded in rabbinic tradition, as he does in certain places, uh, that the death of the righteous atones. There's only one truly righteous. So when we receive God's gracious gift, that's, that's our repentance. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, we receive what he's done. Salvation has come, and countless hundreds of millions have lived out the reality of this. So, last word over to you. You said that Deuteronomy 18, what doesn't speak about Israel being wicked or a prophet being sent to wicked Israel. No, I said but, it doesn't speak of a prophet suffering there. Okay. Well, you know a prophet or a messenger is always going to suffer if they're sent to wicked individuals. That's just clear. In chapter 18, verse 9, it starts out like that. It says, when you enter the land the Lord is giving you, do not imitate their detestable ways. Because if you do, I will raise up for you a prophet. Isaiah, Jeremiah, if you believe Yeshua is a prophet, that does not exclude Yeshua. Now, what do you think the nations are going to do to that prophet? I think it's understood by every reader of the Torah that that prophet is going to be made to suffer. Whether it's a prophet, a messenger, ultimately a martyr, it's true. The prophets in that section, in that so yeah, it's not clear if it's one, two, five, ten, a hundred. Even according to the Rambam, we still have prophecy today. Um, however, what I think is clear is that it's not exclusive to one individual. 
This is just a fact of biblical life, and a fact reiterated in Torah all the time, that the wicked typically fight against what's good. And I'll even give you the benefit of the doubt that if you believe in Yeshua, that would exclude, that would not exclude Yeshua as being a messenger or prophet made to suffer at the hands of wicked Israel. But there is no specific verse saying that it's only talking about one man. There are many verses in the prophets that you would accept as symbolic, as hyperbolic, as poetry. But for some reason, Isaiah 53, you want to take literally. And I think a good explanation or a good example on this is how you choose to understand Zera as some sort of spiritual offspring, which I'm pretty sure does not exclude uh, some sort of spiritual offering, but it's not definite. Just like it's yeah. not definite that Isaiah 53 is only talking about one person. Got it. So uh, what I'd encourage everyone to do, because I, I let Robert Mesa get in the, the, the last word here, Here's what I'd encourage everyone to do then. Go back and study the text, all right? Read from Isaiah 40 all the way to 53, but then specifically 52.13 to 53.12, and ask yourself, who is that speaking of? Whatever your background is, who is that speaking of? Ask God to give you revelation and insight, and ask yourself, is this speaking about one individual, or is this speaking about many people or a nation as a whole or a group of individuals if god wanted to speak about an individual could he do it more clearly should we take this as literal or hyperbolic go back and ask those questions and come to your conclusions hey always nice chatting maybe we'll meet face to face one of these days likewise thank you